Hello and welcome to the second part of our note in which we're discussing this book, The Trouble with Europe by Roger Bootle. Now, plainly, there's been a lot of trouble in Europe recently, great problems caused by the uh, Eurozone uh, sovereign debt crisis. However, according to the markets, the crisis appears to be over. Can they possibly be right about this? Let's now discuss this with uh, our guest, Roger Bootle. Roger, thanks for joining me again. This, if we take a look at this chart of Spanish bond yields, I, I think illustrates the market's judgment as dramatically as anything I can think of. It's cheaper for the Spanish government to, uh, to borrow for over 10 years than at any point before in history. Would you agree with this market uh, assessment that the crisis is over? Well, uh, the markets could be right, or they often are, mm. um, but I have to say I do find this chart utterly bizarre. It does bring home very clearly just the state of mind of the markets. But you know, there are many occasions which the market gets things wrong. Mm. Uh, I've been working in the markets now for, what, for more than 30 years, and although I think they're very good at assessing micro issues over a limited time horizon. When it comes to macro issues over a longer time horizon, and particularly things with a marked political dimension, I think they're extremely bad. Now, after all, though it doesn't come out very clearly in your chart, mm. just before the uh, yeah. euro crisis began, although Spanish bond yields quite aren't, weren't quite as low as they are now, they were extremely low, and the margin over bonds yes. was very, very low. Exactly. So the, we, have a, we have a history of uh, the yeah. market failing to Absolutely. gauge what's going on in Europe. Mm. How are we, are we really going to be able to fix the, uh, the fiscal problems, the, uh, the, the interrelationships without, uh, without countries leaving the euro, in your opinion? People were betting that it wasn't possible a couple of years mm. ago, now they apparently are betting that it can be done. How well, can it be done? Well, it's not impossible in the sense that some of the small countries with very high debt ratios, Greece for instance, I don't see how, see how Greece can grow its way out of mm. this trouble, but the problem can be fixed because the amounts of money are relatively small, so with some sort of debt forgiveness or mm. write-off or whatever, I can see how you can deal with Greece. It's possible, I suppose, that we're going to see a very strong European economy on the back of a very strong world economy. It's possible, and in that context, a combination of economic growth and a bit more austerity might establish the right dynamic. But my own view for a long time has been that the debt ratios are so high in Italy in particular, as a country that worries me, I find it difficult to see how Italy is going to escape from all this if it stays in the Euro. OK, so how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? Presumably we need another set of arrangements. Does this mean that the European Union as such, and not just the Eurozone, needs to be changed fundamentally? Oh, I think the EU needs mm. to be changed fundamentally. And there are a number of different ways in which that may come about. I mean, it's possible that the wave of scepticism that's been sweeping Europe recently is going mm. to result in a fundamental renegotiation of the treaties uh, and that countries like Britain, it's not only Britain, others, will get the sort of arrangements that they actually want. Uh, it's possible. I myself don't think it's very likely and it's going to be difficult to get such a treaty change through. I think a more plausible arrangement might well be one in which effectively we go down the two-tier route or multi-tier route that the core that wants to proceed further to full union, fiscal and political, does so. Uh, but then there's an outer tier, including of course the UK, but maybe mm. some other countries, which don't go down that route. And the core absolutely guarantee the position of the outer group of countries. And in particular, they absolve those countries from pursuit of ever closer union. That might work. And my suspicion though mm. is if we don't get either of those two, then we'll end up with at least one country, probably Britain, leaving. And, OK, if Britain would leave, what, in your opinion, as an economist, are the costs and benefits of doing that? What alternative arrangements would we in the Britain need to, uh, to come up with to uh, enable us to do that? What would happen, what would have to happen, is we'd have to negotiate some sort of trading arrangement with the European Union. It's in both our interests. Is that analogous to what the, the deal the Swiss have at present, or what do you have in mind? Well, a lot of people talk about that. They say either go down the <coughs> Norwegian route or the Swiss route. I don't think that Britain would be well advised to go down either, and I don't think the Swiss arrangements would actually be on offer because the EU is getting pretty fed up with yeah. the Swiss arrangements. I think what actually what the UK ought to aim for is a free trade agreement with the EU. Uh, that's to say outside the single market, but a free trade agreement of the sort that um, we think the United States is going to secure with the EU before too long. OK, so a, a model based perhaps more on the United States than on the European Union. 
Yes, of course, it wouldn't only be the United States. I mean, lots of countries around the world are negotiating free trade agreements with the EU. But the interesting thing is that there aren't that many customs unions around the world. I mean, this is a model, the EU model, that hasn't been followed. What countries and groups of countries around the world are doing is forming free trade associations and then trying to negotiate free trade between those groupings and the EU. That's the model I think we ought to follow. OK, Roger, thank you very much indeed. That was a perhaps less heated discussion of a topic that is bound to generate far more heat than light, both here in the UK and elsewhere in Europe over the next few years. Obviously, there are more things to this than, than uh, the economy, but it's worth keeping the economic costs and benefits in mind throughout the debate.